We are this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're continuing this series that, that we started on what we call core values. And, and this goes with a couple places out in the hall. You'll notice we've got these big posters that mention things like the Bible and mission and the Holy Spirit. And what we're doing with those posters is we are saying these are the seven core values that this church is built on. And we wanted to kind of do a series, Pastor Nathan and I, where we were introducing these to you and explaining why they're important. And today we're on the one that involves service or serving. And so Ephesians 4 is where we'll go. And this is Paul writing, and he says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Sometimes it's easy to love people, and sometimes it requires some bearing with them, right? Putting up with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If someone's talking about other people and you're not feeling at peace and you're just hearing a lot of garbage, just know that's not the Holy Spirit talking. There's a spirit behind that, but it's not the Holy One. This whole unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And there are people who will try to trick you and get you off the path God has for you. That's free. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage. It says so many things. We can't get into all of it today. But Lord, there is a message you want us to draw from your word you want us to hear. So, Lord, we open our ears. Lord, not only our ears to hear, but our heart to receive and our minds, God, that we may apply. And, Father, we just thank you for what you're speaking and doing here at First Assembly. And we just praise you for it in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. We had a little time for pastor appreciation. We had a long passage we read. Can I get you guys with me by playing a quick game? Okay, and for those of you on live stream, we know with the weather, a lot of you are on live stream, we'll let you play at home. Is that all right with you guys? We'll include them. And so what I want you to do is guess a number right now that would correspond to the number of people that has to work to have a Sunday service here at Ocala First Assembly. How many people do you think it takes for us to have this service in this building? Okay, just guess, tell people beside you what number you think, and if you're not sitting next to somebody, just hold it in your heart. 
Y'all ready? I'll, I'll, I'll explain the number. I'll, I'll give you this. There's two, you know, Pastor Nathan and me, so you know you got two. But here's what I came up with, and I actually keep thinking of more. Just the bulletins you hold takes two people. The foyer ministry out there takes at least two people. There's flags that say welcome as you come. That's one person. The cards that are in the seats in front of you involves a team of three people coming in and filling them. Sunday school, there's at least eight people involved in teaching and taking care of things to keep it going. Unlocking the doors of the building, kind of important, whether you realize it or not, that takes a person. The worship teams, usually around 10 people. Our security team, there's about five. Children's church, we need at least eight for it to go. Nursery, we need about six. Cleaning the building, bathrooms and stuff, a team of about three. Sound, we need two people. We need one person for video for live stream. Prayer team, we need about seven people. Greeters and ushers, we need about 20. Pastors, we need at least two. So if you guess 81 people, you are correct. 81. Did anybody guess 81 people? I, I tried to guess before I started, and I was closer to the 49. And, and so I, I couldn't, I was kind of surprised. And here's something else to be even more surprising, is 81 is what we need to cover what we do right now as a church. We've got some other things that we feel God's leading us to do on Sunday morning. We need more people to serve to accomplish what we feel God's wanting us to do as part of the service. A lot of people think, oh, service is pastor getting up and preaching, and so him, that's what we, what we need to have our service. No, it takes a lot of people. And it really, it really is about a team of people working together to do the work of the kingdom. And this is the idea behind service or serving. It's recognizing that for the church to be what it's supposed to be in reflecting Christ, it takes all of us coming together and working as one to accomplish the work of the kingdom. And it also is the idea behind evangelism. It recognizes that for us to really minister and to make a difference in people's life, it's not by what we're going to tell people, it's by what we are going to show them with the love that flows from us. And so service is a big part of what we do as a church. And whether you recognized it or not, I mean, there is a lot. So it, it's all about this passage that we read. The part that I'm wanting us to focus on is the idea that God intends that we be people who serve, people who minister, people who make a difference. All of us have that responsibility. And what we, if we really sat down and read all of Ephesians this morning, what we would discover is, is that these first three chapters Paul's in kind of this doctrinal part, and he's kind of explaining some things so we can kind of, so we can kind of understand them better, and, and we can kind of make sense of what exactly God's done. But now he's moving to this part about what it looks like as we begin to live our Christian life. And I love how he starts this out here in this first verse of chapter one. He says, I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, this is loaded because this is saying several things that, that all kind of fit together. But I want us to pick up in this verse as we're looking at it, this last part. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And I want us to immediately grasp that it doesn't say to the calling some of you have been called, but to the calling that we all have been called. And so whether we realize it or not, some, you know, when I went into ministry, I said, I feel I'm called by God. Laurel going on the mission field. She says, I believe I've been called by God, and that's a proper use of that. But what we miss is we sometimes hear that kind of talk from people going into full-time ministry. And we miss the fact that God has actually called all people to something. Now, the question is, what is it? Now, I believe if we had some people that would be honest, they'd say, I think I know what the call is. 
I, I think that the call God's called me is to the good life, where everything's going to go well for me, and, and people are going to love me, and, and God's going to take care of everything that I'm needing immediately, and I'm not going to struggle, and it's going to be good. If you want to believe that, God bless you. But I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word to destroy that idea, and I don't even have to go to another verse. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. The guy's writing this to us from jail. He's sitting in a Roman prison, uncertain of what his future holds. So if we're sitting around thinking that the call that's on us is that times are going to be good, maybe we need to reinterpret it because the guy who told us we've been called to something is in jail. It's not a good time in jail. I've never been in jail before. I intend to never go to jail. Kind of a life goal for me. People talk about bucket list of things they're going to do. My bucket list is something I'm going to avoid, jail. I, I, if I can, if the day I'm coming and I'm dying and, and I've never been to jail, I'll know that my bucket list has been met, and so I'll be happy. But, but you know, Paul is in jail. And so this tells us that this calling to which we have been called is not going to be good times. He's talking about something else. There's something else he's trying to communicate. It also tells us that if everything seems like it's going bad in our life and things are so terrible we can't do anything, God still has a call on us because Paul's in prison and he still talks about the call to which we're called. And he uses a word here that I think is kind of interesting. He says, a man are worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And this word worthy is kind of just an interesting word because it, it, we know the Bible was writ written in Greek, and, and so worthy is this, this Greek word axos, A-X-I-O-S, and, and it's kind of, it means like a balancing beam, but it, it would be used in, when people would hear that, they would think about a, a scale, and y'all maybe you've seen these old scales that they would use in the store. If you were buying something, they would put like a one-pound weight on one side of it, and if you were buying grapes, they would keep putting grapes in the other side until the scale was balanced. And so you would know, because it was balanced, that there had been a pound of, uh, of grapes put in there. But what if, you know, you have this wet one pound weight, the, the guy puts, his, puts your grapes in there, and it's still like this. It means he hasn't put a pound of grapes in there yet. And you know you're getting ripped off. And Paul's saying, when it comes to what you're called to, make sure that you are giving an amount worthy of the weight of this thing. Don't go around saying, well, that's close enough. Because none of us, if we saw somebody, if they were using those kind of scales, and we saw somebody do that to us, and here's our peanuts here, and they're still up like this, and, and the weight's still good, but he's going to charge us for a pound that he never gave us, we're going to say you're ripping us off. And so Paul's saying, the calling God has given you is so important, don't rip off God. Make sure that what you are putting in to the call he has given you is equal to what he expects to the call that has been presented. But this brings us back to this question, what is this call? What are we supposed to do? Well, the next verse is going to help us. Because it says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In other words, this is about other people. And maybe some of us are disappointed because we like going to church talking about what we get. But this is talking about what we give in what God has called us to do. We are to look at other people, and as we deal with them, we're to be humble, we're to be gentle, we're to be patient, we're to bear with one another in love. We want to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What's this talking about? It's talking about being people who serve and care about other people who are around us. And this is saying that we are to start taking notice of them. We are to recognize that, that the unity of the Spirit means that we've got to care for one another. 
And, and some people think the unity of spirit is everybody takes care of their needs. And that means you're a disunifier of the work of the spirit. But that we're all to come together. We're to watch out for one another. We're to be unified in the work that God has given us to do. And so this means that we are going to be doing things, noticing that there are needs that are around us. And we are going to love in these things. And what do we mean by we say we're, we're going to love? Well, this is, this is the word that's used here. There's different words used in Greek for love. But the Greek word that's used here is the kind of love that God loves us with. And, and somebody says, well, what kind of love does God love us with? Well, you know, most of the time for us to return love, we got to feel that we're loved. But God loved us even though we didn't love him. He still gave himself for us. He still laid down his life. And so the love we're supposed to give to other people is a Christ-like love that even though they are flawed and don't deserve it, we still love them in that way. And so this is, this is a kind of service that we're called to that doesn't take like some move of God in your heart to go out and do something. It's just what we're supposed to be doing. And, and so we should just offer ourselves to help, to make a difference. You know, if, if we're having a dinner over next door and we've ate and there's chairs and tables and cleaning to do, you don't have to pray and say, God, is it your will for me to help? Is this my calling to, to go and to help pick up my chair and clean up my mess? What's your will? Uh, well, you know what? I'm going to have to pray about this overnight, and if it's still here in the morning, I'll come back and get it. Does that take that kind of prayer? Maybe it's just what we do, right? There's a need. We help. We, we show humility, gentleness, patience. We bear with one another in love. We, we, we don't look and say, well, look at the mess they made over there. I'm not helping with that. No, we, we just offer ourselves. There's, it's just a general level of service. We look out the window, hurricanes come, our neighbors got limbs all over the place, and they're out there picking them up, and, 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 and so we're just going to sit there and watch them because that's, that's a good show. Or maybe as Christians, maybe we go out there and help pick up, right? This is just general service. Do we have to pray and say, God, am I supposed to go help that neighbor? Well, I think Jesus would have been out there, so that means we should be out there. And so we, we show this level of love. I'm, I'm reading this book by this Dutch priest named Henry Nguyen. And, and it's this beautiful book. If you're going through a hard time, I really recommend this book to you. It's just a really short little book called Turning My Morning, not morning like you're waking up, but M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, like, like pain, my, my morning into dancing. And, and I was reading about Henry Nguyen, and, and he was a famous writer, and he was one of these people that important people came to for life direction. And he was highly respected. He, he ended up being a professor at Harvard in the Divinity School and just kind of world-renowned. Everybody knew him. Everybody wanted to hear what he had to say. Everybody wanted an audience with him. And he came to this place where he stepped down from Harvard, and he was in his retirement years. And you have to wonder, what would somebody like Henry Nolan do in his retirement years? This guy had it made. This is the kind of guy that, that had lived well and was highly respected, he was important, he was significant. And, and so what would somebody like that do? We think, boy, he's going to have it made. No, he goes, to, he goes to Toronto, Canada, and he joins this place called the Daybreak Community. And, and the point of the Daybreak Community is it was for severely disabled people who have difficulty in communicating, if they can communicate at all, they are people that have to be helped with every area of their life. And he gave the rest of his life working there as a chaplain for people that could never express their appreciation to him. They could never be overwhelmed by the, the, the wisdom that they were receiving. They never would recognize who this person was. And he did it because he was needed to do it. It was a need that was there I don't know that this was something that God said to him. I'd love to hear more about his call. Henry, you are to go and to work with the people that everybody in society turns their head to. 
I don't believe that it was that. I believe it's just he saw a need and he stepped in. And so the first part of what Paul is writing is that there is a call that we have been called to. It is a call to recognize the needs that are around us and for us to step up to those things and to realize we don't have to be praying, we don't have to be seeking God. Is this really what I'm supposed to do? Just help. Just be a person. We're all called to be people who make a difference, who love people, and to be in unity, to do things that bring us together. And so this is, this is what we're supposed to be. But, but there's more to this passage that Paul's giving. And, and it's really important because he gets down to verse 7. And he says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he goes into all this stuff that we don't have time to dig into today. But he talks about the fact that Christ's victory resulted in Christ awarding or giving gifts to the people who follow him. Now, what would these gifts be? Well, through Christ's victory, it was the start or the launch of the church age. And so Christ has given special gifts that are to be given, and they are to be used to do special ministries. Paul goes on, he, he liked this, there's several of his writings that we see this idea that he talks about the fact that we are, the church is the body of Christ, and we all have a place in it. Nobody as a, it can say, well, I don't, I don't belong there. There's nothing I can do. He says, you know, some people are fingers. Some people may be hands. Some people may be elbows. Some of us maybe are the ears. Some of us are the feet. Some of us toes. But everybody is important. We're each significant. We each have value. And, and the Bible talks about the unity of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mean that we're all alike. The cool thing about the church is we're all different. And it's why church can be fun. And it's why sometimes you see somebody do something at church and you think, what in the world was that? Because you would never do it, but they did it. And we're not all alike. We're not all the same. But at the same time, we're all called. We're all united together by the Holy Spirit. And we have all been given the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be in operation. And, and Paul goes on. And he talks about some of these gifts. Here's five. He says there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. And, and so here's these five gifts that, that as you look at them, each of them have a different ministry. An apostle is usually a person who's going to be starting ministries. And, and they begin things. They go to areas that the gospel hasn't been presented. Or they give like a, a dynamic level of leadership to bring things together. And so this is the, kind of the ministry of an apostle a prophet, my experience has been, man, boy, I could talk for an hour about this one. I, oh, there's so many people messing this prophet thing up. And I just got to tell you, if somebody thinks their job as a prophet is to tell you who the next president is, they don't sound much like God's prophets. And I, I just, I think maybe that got judged in this last election. And so we should recognize a prophet calls people to the word of God to live a holy life. And if somebody's message is just to let you know what's going to happen tomorrow when you wake up, and that's all they're saying over and over and over, God can use somebody for that. But if that's all their message is, that's not God using them. And so I'm not I'm just rolling that back. But anyway, prophets lead you into holiness, deeper into the Word of God. Evangelists bring people to the kingdom of God. Shepherds is talking about pastors, and so pastors are there to show compassion and minister to the people of God. Teachers are people that God has used, and he uses them to explain the Bible to us in a greater way. And, and so there's these gifts that are here, and, and Paul goes on and he explains what they're for in verses 12 through 14. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And, and so, you know, people say, I don't think I have to be at church. I don't need to be at church. Oh, really? You don't need ministry to, to be equipped and to, so you can work and build up the church, which seems to be important to God, but even though you don't think it is, but to build up the church, the body of Christ, this will continue until we all come 
to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. What's the purpose of the gifts? If we're isolating ourselves and say we can do it on our own, we are isolating ourselves from the value of the gifts of other people that are necessary to complete and grow us in the things of Christ. Now, this leads to a question. Does this mean there's only five gifts that God's given and we only need five people and we can go forward? I hope. I get so sick of the celebrity culture that exists in today's church. And we have taken people, and we have lifted some of them higher than Jesus. I know that because I see when some of them fall, there's people who walk away from Jesus because of someone who was human doing something humans do. And if, if, if anybody's failures is enough to take us away from the one they're supposed to be about, then we've, got, we've lifted them too high. And, and this is, I look at this verse And I realize that there are people who are so lifting up certain individuals because their gifts are obvious and they're being used in an obvious way that we make them far too important. And so I I come to a place that I really worry when I read stuff like this because I know that, that we tend to be people who want to worship certain things that seem special. And, you know, if Taylor Swift says do it, we all do it. Right? And maybe you say, I don't even know who Taylor Swift is. God bless you. What rock have you been living under the last 10 years? We'd just like to know. But, you know, if there's people that we, we have a celebrity culture, and we worship these things, and, and, and the, this isn't saying you find these five people and you lift them up because this is my experience is I believe that in this church, there are multiple people that God uses to start things and provide dynamic leadership. I think people have, there's a lot of people with an apostolic anointing. I think there's, I, I talked to some of you guys, and you're very black and white in the way you see things, and you really speak the word a lot, and I can see the ministry and the anointing of a prophet that, that's on you. And, and there's others of you. I see a really strong compassion gift. And and, and so I recognize immediately that you've got kind of a pastoral anointing that's on you. And I, I see people who, who are teachers and, and people who can lead people to Christ, and they've got a gifting in this. And so I believe that not everybody's called the full-time, but I believe that these gifts aren't given to make five people special in every church and everybody come and bow at their feet, but it's just God's way of doing ministry. And, and I think that, that it's spread wide across here, and we do wrong to find five people that we can worship and not doubt ever because they've got certain anointings and it makes them better than everybody else. And even beyond that, we're told as we look, there's other gifts that are given. If we add all the numbers of gifts list and take every each unique one, there's 21 different gifts given throughout the New Testament. And I believe that there, I've seen other things in operation that even go beyond that. So I just believe there's multiple gifts. And the whole point of it is that God's got a lot of ways to use us. And there's a lot of ways that these gifts are, are just, they kind of overlap. And I've seen people that's got multiple gifts. And I've seen people, a lot of times getting started, that they're not even sure what their gifts are. I've known people who've been in churches for years and years that don't know what their gifts are. And I'm going to let you in a little secret. You don't need to know what your gifts are. You just need to be active doing something for the kingdom of God. And, and we used to give these gift tests out when Lois and I were starting a ministry. We'd have these papers, and we'd give them, we want to know what your gifts are. And we'd give this gift and this gift survey, and they'd, they'd have all this stuff. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, and it helps people come. But, but I found out the best test of what your gifts are is what does God have you doing now? Not what does some paper say, but what does God have you doing how are you in operation? Are you, are you bringing people at work around you and you're, you're talking about Jesus to them? Oh, I hear a little bit of an evangelistic anointing in that. 
Are you a person that, that, that sees people who are struggling and, and, and you're there to lift them and pray with them and cry with them? Oh, I see compassion anointing going there. And you find you're gravitated toward those kind of people. And so these gifts are so important and vital. It's not important that we know what they are. It's just important that we're exercising a ministry. I don't know that my ear knows that it's an ear. I, I'm not really sure about that. Seems like it wants to grow a lot of hair on it. I think it thinks it's the top of my head. I'm sorry, that was gross for so many of you guys, and I, I deeply apologize to you guys for that, for that but it's true. And, and it's horrible, but it's true. And, and so, but I, you know what matters to me is not that my ear has full recognition and it passed the, the test to know that it was an ear. It, what's important is the ear just hears that it listens like an ear's supposed to do, and that my nose smells like a nose is supposed to smell, and it doesn't try to listen because I don't think my nose is going to be a good listener. You know, the, these parts of our body, they do what they're supposed to do. They're, they're, they're designed a certain way. And when we're just saying, God, use me, and we step out into ministry, it's going to start working out. And this is I, what I see Paul saying here after all these things, that, that this moving to maturity. He wraps all this up with these two verses. Rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do you want to grow up and be more of the Christian God wants you to be? Do you want to be a person that people sees as useful and is vital and is important? Service is what opens the door for these things. It's not us coming in and saying the right magic words that we know how to make stuff happen. That's called conning your way in. But the way you work your way into the kingdom of God is just doing things that make a difference in the life of people around you. And I've always loved the Bible teaches that when you operate in that way, the Bible teaches that our gifts will open doors for us. And gifts will always rise to the top. And so we don't have to, we don't have to make people believe in us in a certain way. Just do what God's put in front of you to do, and God's going to work it out. We're all called to service. And so I want to encourage you in this church, we have been trying to build a service culture. We've been trying to make a difference. You notice these green and blue cards that are in front of you in your seats. This one that says the green card, it says next steps. And, and there's a place there that it says join a serve team. And so I want to encourage you to just make yourself available. We're going to have this fall harvest outreach that Startle is putting together for us just reaching out to families and kids and making a fun day for them. Just a way of saying to the community, hey, we're here. We love you. We want to celebrate your kids with you. We want to give you a fun time together. And we can use help for that. So help us. You don't have to pray. Don't say, God, are you wanting me to be on a serve team to help reach families? And I'll, I'll tell you what the Lord's going to say right now to you. Yes! Why haven't you been? Yes! Yes! I want you to do something. I want, I want to use you. And so let God use you. And I know sometimes we got people that listen to our services online. They're, they're truckers on the road. It's going to be hard to be on a serve team for an event when you're driving. You're, you're somewhere in Mississippi right now all right, or wherever God may have you. It's going to be a little hard and maybe a little different for you. Maybe you've got little kids that you're going to need to be bringing to the fun instead of being there serving. There's different times in our life that we do these things, but we're all called to do something. Somebody says, well, I, yeah, I got those kids. I, I can't do anything. Yeah, you can because there's going to be people with kids that are going to gravitate around you, and you can be talking about how Christ helps you through your tough time with your kids. See, there's different ways we can be used, different gifts, but we're all called to something. Will you bow your heads with me across the building? And my hope is, I, I don't ever want to think that, you know, we, we somehow think that, that 
following God means just God doing stuff for us, but to recognize God gives us the privilege to be a part of what he's done. He's called us all to be part of his team, to be part of the ministry. But before that can happen in your life, you've got to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Before you can serve others with the love he's given, you've got to receive the love that he gives. And the only way to do that is to recognize that you've been living life on your own, that you've been living in sin, you've been living away from God, and, and it's time for you to turn things around and to start following Jesus. And so this morning, I'm just going to ask, is there anybody who will lift their hand and say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with God. I need to make things right with Him. I want to start living for Jesus. Is there anybody this morning who will lift their hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need to start living for Jesus Christ. I need to turn things around. You could raise your hand at home on, if you're watching on live stream or on the road, wherever you may be. God knows our hearts. And we're going to right now, those of you that have lifted your hand, even if you didn't, but you're wanting to become a follower of Jesus Christ, what I want you to do right now is just pray this prayer with us. And this will be the beginning of you following Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I have made mistakes. I've done things wrong. Forgive me for every one of my sins. I want to start living for you and be the person you've created me to be. Thank you for this new start. In your name, Jesus. Jesus.